Facebook Live. Okay, I think we're live now on Facebook at our Migrant Women Reality Watch number 24. And I'm very happy to have uh, with us today, first of all, who just appeared on screen, uh, Alicia, uh, who is um, the coordinator of uh, Arab Women Solidarity Association, Belgium, based in Belgium. Uh, they're our members. Um, and uh, secondly, Sadi, who is also based in Belgium, and she's an artist who's working also internationally and a filmmaker, a feminist filmmaker and writer. And the reason we are uh, together today is because of a significant event. Nawal al Sadawi, a famous, uh, iconic Egyptian feminist, but also international feminist um, uh, and a fighter for human rights and for women's rights in particular, died on 21st of March. And um, I think it's an important figure for us as a network, but also for our members. And this is why uh, we decided to have this conversation, a memorial, a tribute uh, to remember uh, the life um, and the deeds of Nawal and to share it with those who are following us and to make sure that we remember this woman. So I'm going to pass the floor to our guests. I think that if they want to add anything about themselves, I think that's also important. There is a reason we invited these two women because they have uh, their own connections with Naval, uh, personal and professional. And if you want to speak about those, please be free. And uh, otherwise, Sadi also wanted to share uh, with us a video of Naval. And this is how we wanted to open this discussion so that anybody who follows this conversation can actually see Naval herself and her words and, and hear her speak. Shall I start? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Sadie. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, uh, dear Anna and dear uh, European Network of Migrant Women for the invitation. Um, and yes, I have a big, I would say, a connection with Nawal El Sadawi because she helped me as a young girl to understand myself and also um, my position in this world, I would say. So I started to read her when I was uh, growing, growing up as as a girl uh, becoming uh, a woman. And then when I uh, became older, when I was at university, when I started to be an active as a feminist, I would say, um, I also had uh, the pleasure of meeting her several times. I had, I had the chance to interview her a couple of times, but I, especially what I liked also was how she always met the, the, the woman like it was very warm and at the, at, the, at the one hand and at the other hand, it, there were always difficulties, which always gives this kind of uh, a specific atmosphere. And as I'm a filmmaker, I, I'd like uh, or I prefer to see her instead of me, because I think that um, women as her, we almost never see her, those women on television. And I think it's very important. And as a filmmaker or as a visual artist, I'm a little bit working on the archive between men and women. And to say it in a not too negative way, the, the, the balance, it's, it's not so good. So I also try a little bit to restore this balance by showing um, films, videos, interviews uh, with women. Um, so that's why I wanted to, to show this video. It's just maybe, I, I mean, it's just a random uh, video. I wanted actually to have her in conversation with another woman. So that's why I did not choose a video where she is in conversation with a, with a man. Um, but otherwise, it's just how she is, how she talks, how I remember her. And I hope that people who met her, who knew her, 
um, enjoy her her speaking again, her voice, and that for the younger maybe women or the women that don't know her, uh, yeah, that they will also be uh, interested and fascinated by uh, Nawal uh, Asadawi. So let's start uh, with this. It's a little bit long, but I hope that we uh, take the time uh, and the respect towards her uh, to listen uh, to her and also to look at her and, and, and see her beautiful face. Is it, do you see it now? The second question related to the quote, your quote about writing about truth in a world that lies. Uh, yes, you are surrounded. When I was born, a girl, I was surrounded by lies and subtle lies, postmodern lies, because at the beginning, when I was a child, lies were very crude, mm. very visible. Mm. Uh, when I grow up, the more I grow up, the more I travel. I was in exile. I lived 20 years in exile in the US, in the United States, and in other places. Lies are becoming subtle. Subtle and subtle, you cannot discover. There is a whole technology of deception and spying. You know, the capitalist work, capitalism and imperialism cannot survive without lies. You cannot exploit anybody, a woman or a man or a child, unless you lie to them and deceive them. Because without deception, you cannot exploit them. And you deceive women by what? You tell her, oh, you will go to hell. If you disobey God, you will burn. You, they told me when I was a child, you will be burnt in hell fire because you disobey God. This is a deception. I wonder how we can promote more women and that is the reason why we launched Athena 40, mm -hmm. who are powerful because of the power of their minds. And yes. this way they can break, you know, established, outdated systems. A good question. How can we create this awareness, this mind? How we change the mindset of women and men? This is the role of writers and creative people. This is the role of creativity. It's very important to bring this new knowledge. Why I'm saying that? Because education does not provide people with knowledge, real knowledge. They provide people with fragmented knowledge, fragmented, you know. I graduated from the medical college, ignorant of politics of economy, of uh, psychology, even psychology, because I studied chest, I became a chest surgeon at the beginning. So this fragmentation of knowledge, you divide everything to specialize, make people maybe good physicians, but uh, ignorant politically of the oppression of women or the poor or anything. So they become self-centered. But we need, as you say, to change the mind, powerful mind, a new mind that is aware of the real causes of oppression for women and the poor and the blacks, and to understand what's this religion, what's this religious fundamentalist movement all over the world, what's that? To understand that and to link it to women oppression and to the oppression of the poor people. And that's what we need, awareness and organization. I think we should organize because we are standing alone. You have lived a life full of experiences, full of challenges and full of achievements. If you were to pick one pivotal moment, a moment perhaps that you felt, okay, I'm going to dedicate my life to change things for the better, and it's going to be fearless, tireless, and non-stop until the end. Uh, I remember 
examining in uh, when I was a student in gynecology, and I was examining the, a Sudanese woman gynecologically, and then I I was shocked when I didn't find any genital organs in fabulation, you know, FGM, female genital mutilation, because, you know, female circumcision in Egypt is very minor. They cut just the tip of the clitoris. So when I examined Egyptian women, normal, I find it the genital organs are there. Labia menorah, labia majora, even the clitoris. But with a Sudanese, the first Sudanese woman I examined, I was shocked. And I was young, I was a student, 20, 19 or 20 years of age, very young. I was shocked. I didn't know why. I thought this is something hereditary. But then I discovered this is how they do circumcision in Sudan. I started to remember my childhood because I myself was circumcised when I was a child, but I have forgotten that. You know, they call it childhood amnesia. Children forget pain. This moment, I, I remember my childhood and I started to say, oh my God, what's happening? What did they do that? And then I related that to women, circumcision in Egypt and in other places. And then I started to see boys being circumcised in the medical college and how children suffer male. So I started to connect female circumcision to male circumcision, to politics, to everything. And my, my brain started to breathe, to see things I never saw. I was blind, as if I was blind, and then opened my eyes. I am very happy that this is happening and that you started that. So I am amazed that you came from Athens to start this year. This is wonderful. I am happy. And this makes me optimistic that women can organize. Women can be brave enough to leave their own home and come to other countries and start to organize. We need that. So the message, I don't have messages because I, I don't like to teach people. We learn from our own experience, but what I would like to say, we need organization. We need to work together globally and locally. But really what I would like to say to such a very important gathering that women should look to their experience. I built all my life, all my what on my experience, to learn from our own experience, to be ourselves, to be myself, to say what I think and pay the price, because we cannot have the freedom without the price. So this is, a, I would say, a small, uh, beautiful, also very hard, uh, introduction, I think, uh, to Nawal. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sadi. Um, also, feel free if you want to, if you want to comment on this, if Alicia, if you want to give feedback to this, I have some feedback, but uh, may, maybe, uh, Alicia, do you want to say something also about your relationship with uh, Nawal? And maybe in relation to what was just said, I mean, she said quite a few very important things. I was taking notes about the whole technology of deception, about uh, how we're changing minds, the role of creativity, the fragmented knowledge. And the most significant for me personally is her commitment to being, to live life without lies and to be yourself and to speak the truth. Um, so this is my, my, my takeaway from this, but uh, Alicia, if you wanna react or if you just wanna say yes, yes. your part, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you again for inviting uh, us with the Arab Women Solidarity Association. Yes, uh, she said a lot of important things. Uh, for me, I, uh, I will keep 
that she say that we need to organize ourselves. Um, and th that's something I've heard a lot from her, that we need as women also to, to gather and, and to act locally and at a global way too. Uh, and I like the way in which she say that uh, she don't like to teach people and that we learn from our own experience. And, and you know, she's, she's, she has thousand lives. She's full of experiences. She learned so much. Um, uh, she didn't teach, but in a way she, she for example, Arab Women Solidarity Association Belgium, our organization, she, she was a godmother. So uh, she, she, in a way, she was a teacher for her. She was inspiring us. But at the same time, she, she let us being so independent and, 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 and she liked she honored independence and and so yeah that's why I, I, I was happy to hear that too but uh, um, I don't know about my personal and and professional relation with her you, you know she she had found AUSA so Arab Women Solidarity Association in Egypt in 1982 with other uh, Arab feminists, including uh, Fatima Manisi, you know, the Moroccan sociolo sociologist. And um, Aoussa was close in Egypt under Mubarak because he took position against the American intervention and the war in Iraq. And when uh, the founders of Aoussa Belgium met her and discussed with her after a conference in Brussels, uh, they, they, they were talking about the cliche they faced, they, they were thinking about how we can promote Arab women's rights in Belgium. And that was Nawal. She broke this idea and expressed her wish to open a branch of AUSA here in Belgium. So at that time, um, suddenly th that was uh, a, 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 a huge symbol of our struggle and the, the, the women organized themselves as just as she, she said in this, in this uh, interview uh, and our association was born uh, in 2004 and then become a feminist and secular association in 2006 so we have a, a huge connection with her she, she's yeah she's our godmother uh, but um, since the beginning she support us but encourage us to have our independence and our freedom to adapt to our context here in Belgium and to to decide uh, our priorities. So, uh, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, personally, uh, when I first met her, I was very young. And then I was organizing a whole conference because we did uh, three conferences with Nawal uh, here in Brussels. I also organized three conferences in in, in uh, 2006, 2007, and 2011. And when I met her, I was very young, and um, and you know I was feeling a bit stressful. And we start the conference late, and she said something like. We start later, but it's because of AUSA. You know, maybe they're not so well organized. We need to get organized women. And she said again something about that. So that's why I'm, I'm so happy to hear that she's still talking about organizing and getting organized and, and, and professional as women. And you know, at that moment, she, she said that frankly, but with a huge smile and everybody loved. And, and I think this is something um, very important in her way to teach, even if she said she doesn't like to teach, because she says things without the true, but she she do it like a rebe rebellious child or with joyful and, and with a big smile. She's really frank, but with this smile and positive way to do it. So um, yeah, I was really impressed by her and inspired by her, you know, she's, she was a strong woman. She had lived thousand lives as a doctor, as a writer, as a woman. She has been fired more than six times. She, she's been in prison several times. She's written more than 40 books. So it was a bit impressive to meet her for the first time. But, um, but then she, she put me at ease by being so frank like this, so authentic and by being real, by saying the truth, as she said right now in this interview. Uh, so that makes her close to people. And I remember she touched my face many times. And then she made me think about my, my own grandmother with her big eyes, her wonderful white long hair. She was 
like she was telling me some advices about life, you know. And again, she mentioned that to, to do your own experience and to recognize this as a woman and, and to see your own experience that make you learn actually. So yeah, it's connected to what I, I felt with uh, the first time I saw her. Thank you, thank you, Alicia. Um, I myself mm, didn't have such extensive experience or practically no experience, but I met her once in a conference in London, only on the stage. Uh, it was a feminist it's a phil philia conference um, where she was uh, just just how you saw her in this interview, just how you described her, very frank, very subversive, very not afraid to kind of attack but at the same time, with clearly not the intention to undermine anyone or, or it was her, her way of passing those messages. I mean, she would throw into a conversation something seemingly unrelated, speaking about American imperialism when we were speaking about something, but she would find all of those connections uh, through little stories uh, and very, very personal. Like this is how I remember her on stage and bringing personal stories and making women to answer very personal questions as well. Um, this is what I found very mm, kind of inspiring, but, 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 but also something new that you don't really need it often in some you know, public debates or conferences. So I, I don't know, Sadi, do you want to add anything on this? How you remember maybe Namal, because you interviewed her also several times. Do you have some personal recollections about her. If you want to say anything. No, Sadid doesn't want to say to, to, to speak uh, about this, but we are going to have a question that we prepared. Um, we have a well, we discussed, we have a little discussion, but because obviously the whole life of Naval can be covered in many documentaries and books probably will be written anyways. But now Alicia was speaking about her whole life. And you said, Alicia, many lives that she lived as a doctor, as a writer, as an activist. Um, and for in your experience, for example, um, what do you think? So you spoke about how she influenced the very existence of AUSA in Belgium and how you remember her, but more from a global perspective, what would you say are the most significant contributions of Naval? Whether it's women's rights, whether it's the secularist movement, whether it's the fight against colonialism, anything that you think really left a very big mark that wouldn't be there without her, maybe. You're muted. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, it's hard to say because she contributes a lot, but I think she, in a way, she contributed to break cliche on Arab women at a global level and in Europe, with our secular feminists, but also with our critique of imperialism, of colonialism. Um, she, she contributed a lot to Arab feminism and to feminism in Europe uh, with her books. And, and, and yeah, she, she mentioned it in the interview. She, she, her big fight was about female genital mutilation. She was herself mutilated at the age of six years old. So, and you know, in Egypt, it was a, a medicalized practice. It means that it were performed by health professionals at hospitals. So all girls, all women, whatever the social status of the families. And um, in 2008, the Egyptian government uh, decreed that uh, female genital mutilation was a crime and it was punished by law. And this is an important step forward. And I think she contributed a lot to that with her fight for the, against that. And uh, even if girls are still being cut in Egypt, she, she, it's a huge contribution and that, that also had global effects. Um, but in, 
a general way. I think with her books, like The Woman and Sex, the one who faced big criticism and censure, she denounced the patriarchal system and all the consequences on a woman's life. She, she broke taboos, such domestic violence, uh, um, sexuality, and, and also virginity. This is so important in Arab countries to break taboo on that, of abortion, sexual violence, child sexual abuse, and all different forms of oppression uh, which women are victims. So this is a huge contribution. And she's considered like a pioneer feminism uh, in the Arab world. Um, one thing also that we faced uh, with Aousa, I think she's also um, described women's sexuality and names the female anatomy. She, uh, she, in, she reconnects the, the body of women, she reconciled women's body with the Arab language, for example. Like uh, she, she's not afraid of uh, using words uh, in Arab, uterus, uh, clitoris, imen, all of these words were not used, especially in Arab, uh, um, uh, in Arabic. So this is also something that she used to break the cliche. And so, yeah, I, I cannot say one contribution. It's, it's so many actually. At, at the same time for, women's rights and human's rights because everything is connected in, in a global um, uh, way for her. Uh, can I ask you something else? Uh, Alicia, do you think Nawal is known enough uh, in Europe uh, among the European feminists, let's say, the, you know, if we speak about the mainstream feminist movement, do you think she's recognized and known enough or how you would want her to be known? Mm -hmm. Maybe it depends, but at the same time, uh, four generations have read her book, but she's, of course, very famous in the Arab feminism. She, she inspired other feminist women, uh, Arab feminist women. Uh, but yes, maybe it's, uh, it's a pity that we wait that uh, she, she died to talk more about her in, in Europe. But I, I've heard that she was was described at the Simone of the, the Arab world, her nickname. And uh, I also heard that she doesn't, uh, she, she was considering herself much more radical than her. Um, and uh, she, she was proudly uh, saying that she, she, was, she had been divorced three times and, and uh, that Simone de Beauvoir was dominated by her partner. So, so yes. Um, Personally, as uh, working with AUSA, we, uh, we, we say that Arab feminism is not famous enough. enough. We need to talk more about Arab feminists here in Europe and in, in, in mainstream media, of course. But I think Nawal uh, had, um, had worldwide contribution uh, and she, she was quite famous. Yes. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to also let everyone know that you, uh, uh, in your organization, AUSA, uh, are now collecting the, the um, tributes or testimonies or stories. Maybe you can also s say a couple of words about that. Yes, yes. Uh, we we launched uh, a call for contribution because we want to, uh, to gather all of uh, it could be poem, text, uh, pictures, anything that uh, connects you to Nawal Sadawi and, and how she inspired you, how she contributes to your life, your, your personal um, uh, feminism or uh, yeah, anything that, uh, that is connected to her and, and that you want to share, uh, please send us uh, an email and we will try to to do something with that, we want really to make a, a, um, a female of, of her and, and uh, trying to uh, to put her and to thank her for that. Like we, um, yes, we say that we are uh, uh, the new generation of Nawal Sada with feminism in a way. That's very nice. We're going to uh, put um, a link, an email in the in the description. Yes. So anybody Great. can 
Thanks. If you if you have read her book and if you like it and if you had some uh, personal declics, if you had anything that's connected with her, please share with us. I think it's really important to spread it and to uh, to make her voice heard, but also to bring uh, to to free the, the the voice for from other women as well and girls. Mm -hmm. Something that you mentioned, Alicia, about you or your organization or younger feminists who are the new generation of Nawal al-Sadawi. And at the same time, uh, she herself uh, said it numerously about how she was portrayed or described as, as, as this um, angry woman or the, the savage in a sense, and then she's saying that, well, the truth is savage and I'm speaking the truth. Um, is, do you have any commentary on, on this image or idea of an angry feminist that, um, and, and, and how maybe it reconciles with um, uh, the feminism that we're living now in 2021 in, in, in Europe in particular, uh, because I think her, you know, the, the image of truth telling, the, the, the message of truth telling is, is so cross cutting from her interviews and her writing. And um, we, we know that it is difficult generally to speak the truth and as a woman in particular. Um, but what, what are your thoughts about uh, this image of Nawal as being the savage or angry or radical woman? Mm, well, I think it's uh, an image that a technical and an image that many other feminists face. Uh, it's um, a, a really a way that has been used to discredit women and to 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 sh well to cut her their their voice to present them as a angry woman and savage women. All feminists could be presented like this just to discredit them. And now, well, it's it's even more because she's a secular woman in Arab countries. She's also an old woman. She's, um, she, yeah, all of this, it's, easy, it's so easier to present her as an angry and savage woman. So, and I think she, she uses it. This is my personal point of view, but I think she, she in a way she play with that because that help even more her to be um, to to say things without detour and to say yeah if you see me as a savage let 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 me think let me tell what I think you know so yeah I think it's um, it's yeah for me to present women as angry women it's it's the the thing that all feminists can deal today it's so connected to what we we have seen here and even if we have like people getting interested in feminism, if we, we see pink wa washing and all of this, we still face that as women. Um, like we are unhappy and yeah, all the, the media are doing this. And it's it's worse when you, you are uh, old woman, I think you can, you can really face this kind of things. And uh, she was at the same time playing with this to, to, to be even more uh, audacious or, 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 or true and uh, yeah and I think she was personally I really think she was brilliant with that so um, yeah I don't know if that answer your question it, it definitely does uh, especially in terms of the technicality of using this image against the women and yeah. uh, to discredit them it's uh, it's so common yes and I think it also connects to what she said and the, the piece that um, Sadi showed in the beginning about the, this uh, technology of deception, because it's it's not true that if you're speaking the truth that you're necessarily angry per se or a savage. Um, and and here also, I think it's also connected to secularity because um, she was accused of apostasy. She was... Uh, she was really uh, saying aloud what many other people think about religions, and and then she she dared to uh, question religions and to say that uh, religions is used to justify injustices, and some answer easier answer could be oh she's a crazy and savage woman you know 
it's easier to to exclude her than to question yourself and question all the religious backgrounds with especially with all the taboo we face in the Arab countries connected to that. That's my personal opinion again. That's Yes. Well, then in this case, um, the other question that we had is uh, maybe some recommendations or, or yeah, recommendations um, of, to, of of the of whether it's books or talks or conference ex excerpts uh, or anything else where Nawal is captured that um, we can, uh, or in your opinion, that uh, we could. Uh, look at and read and get inspired and obviously there is a lot of her work but you you are the experts on this much more um and i know that uh, alicia you have one record from your conference that also or, or organized right uh where she was taking part in belgium and we're going to listen to this and sadi at the same time has some quotes uh from um uh, from the writing of her own words of, of Nawal. Uh, so maybe we can share this and we can share the recording as well. I don't know, Sadi, do you, do you want to go with the quotes? Hi. Um, yes. So um, I think if I can, can, can give some recommendations, I would just say that you have to, to to read all her books. I mean, like just start reading. Um, I, I'm not going uh, to to take out one of her books, but I also think it's for me at least. I really enjoy her talks. So on, uh, I'm happy that on social media you have a lot of them, and so I really really recommend uh, everybody to go and, and look her up and find her on YouTube and, and, and other channels, because this is, you, you don't only learn, like, like learn from what she is telling us, but also how she is telling it us. And she learns actually how, how to, how to behave in an interview or in a conversation and, and how to play a little bit. So I think it's a little bit uh, the same, uh, like with Fatia Mernissi also, she, she learned how we can, uh, when we get a question, how to, to talk around it, for example, or I don't know, it's really amazing how, how in her, even her, like her body, how she uses her body, actually she uses everything, uh, and she also uses uh, her body. To, to 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 say what she wants to say but so yes um same as um that i wanted to show her her face and her voice i i would love to share a small fragment of um of one of her books um and it's a book from uh, 75 it's written in seven it's published in 75 and it's uh, uh, women at point zero and actually this book reminds me also a little bit it's it's i would say it's a little bit about killing also women who kill and it reminds me also of a film of chantal ackerman where there is also a prostitute who kills one of her clients and um i mean so i think it's also very good like to to make the small uh, connections what i like to do to other women, from one woman to another woman, because this is, in my eyes, how we try uh, to build a sisterhood, I would say. So I, I try to do this, and that's why I wanted also to, to make some connections to some quotes. And th this is quotes that I found actually in, in interviews. So I can start with, um, yeah, let's, I will just read a small part of, of her book. What reminds, what I also want to say, what I really like about her is that she is also funny in a way. So she uses humor. And I think this is very important because this is actually also what connects us, connects us because it's, it's, um, it's very heavy what she says. It's very important and it's, it's about change. And um, using this in a very light or in a humorous way makes it that we more understand it. I, I do think that it makes it more understandable and easy to, to do something with it. So, okay. Um, let me speak. Do not interrupt me. I have no time to listen to you. 
They are coming to take me at six o'clock this evening. Tomorrow morning, I shall no longer be here, nor will I be in any place known to man. This journey to a place unknown to everybody on this earth fills me with pride. All my life, I have been searching for something that would fill me with pride, make me feel superior to everyone else, including kings and princes. Each time I picked up a newspaper and found the picture of a man who was one of them, I would spit on it. I knew I was only spitting on a piece of newspaper which I needed for, the covering, for covering the kitchen shelves. Nevertheless, I spat and then left the spit with where it was to dry. Anyone who saw me spitting on the picture might think I knew that particular man personally, but I did not. I am just one woman, and there is no single woman who could possibly know all the men who get their pictures published in the newspapers. For after all, I was only a prostitute, and no matter how successful a prostitute is, she cannot, she cannot get to know all the men. However, every single man I did get to know filled me with but one desire to lift my hand and bring it smashing down on his face. But because I'm a woman, I've never had the courage to lift my hand. And because I am a prostitute, I hid my fear under layers of makeup. Since I was successful, my makeup was always of the best and most expensive kind, just like the makeup of respectable upper-class women. Only my makeup, my hair, and my expensive shoes were upper-class. With my secondary school certificate and suppressed desires, I belonged to the middle class. By birth, I was lower class. So this is just one uh, part of a book. And um, when I was looking for quotes, I found actually a quote about the quote. I mean, she said something about quotes, which I liked, which was also very funny. She says, she answers, I am very angry today. Look at this silly magazine. They have misquoted me. It reads, I am bigger than the president. Who am I to say I am bigger than the president? But I do think that novelists are more important than politicians. No one knows who the president was during Virginia Woolf's time. Do they? Do you? This is a conspiracy or ignorance. I will call the editor of the magazine or write about it in my column. I read the newspapers in the evening because it, spo it spoils my mood. I must save the mornings to write. Um, yeah, I have, um, I have Sorry, some- I just have to say it was so brilliant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is what I mean. Like she, with a little joke, she, 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 she adds lots of things into it and even a little reference to another woman. Um, yeah, so um, women's liberation, which means feminism in different languages refer to liberating women and girls from the historical, patriarchal, capitalist, racist, imperialist, colonial, religious system, dominating the West and the East, the North and the South. We live in one world, not three worlds. Um, here, obviously I am against killing, whether a man or a woman is the killer. However, in some cases, women have no choice. Some women kill because they have no alternative way of fighting back. As individuals, they are weak. The answer to this is for women to mobilize and fight as larger more significant political entities. Another one. No, I'm not rich. But then, since when were, were dissident writers in it for the money? But still, I am privileged, even though I'm poor. I am in the 5%. I have an apartment and air conditioning. Some people in Egypt live in graves. And they're the lucky ones. Some don't even have a grave. 
she wrote also a lot about uh, creativity. So she says about herself, if I do not write, then I will kill. C creativity writing is very important. And so is creativity in general, because it takes your energy. It also gives you pleasure. It satisfies you. For people who kill, their creat creativity is diverted into killing and destruction, not towards construction. So they destroy themselves and they destroy others because they don't have pleasures, pleasure in life. They are sad and depressed. They're angry and there is no compensation only by writing for me. This is why I teach creativity and dissidence. When you are a dissident and not creative, then you risk destroying yourself and others. But when you are a dissident and you are creative, your creativity builds you up and the others around you. Um, here you also have revolutionary men with principles were not really different from the rest. They used their cleverness to get in return for principles what other men buy with their money. Um, Yeah, there is um, here the oppression, and here she takes she talks about the West because she's do, giving an interview to someone uh, to a, a European journalist. Here, the oppression of women is very subtle. If we take female circumcision, the excision of the clitoris is done physically in Egypt, but here it, it is done psychologically and by education. So even if women have the clitoris, the clitoris was banned. It was removed by Freudian theory and by the mainstream culture. I don't know, maybe um, I have, you have to read the interviews. You, will, you can also find uh, lots of them on, um, on the internet. I see that it's all, almost four o'clock. So I don't know if you, if you still want to listen to the audio, we can listen to it now or I can continue. I think we can listen to the audio. I just before we close, General, before I forget, you, Sadi, you said there are YouTube videos. Is there anything specific maybe that we need to know where to find uh, more? We're just typing Nawal al Sadavi on social media and, and is there any websites that... Uh... No, I think lots of them are now on, you, on YouTube and you see that there is a, cha is a, a small change. Like in the beginning, most of the of the interviews and videos were done by women and, and women's organizations. And the latest year, she became a little bit more popular, I would say. And so it's also done with nice shootings and a big podium and male interviewers. <laughs> but um, you can, you now you just look at you, you just type her name and, and you can find them easily. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Unless you both want to add anything as a final, whatever you want to say in tribute to Nawal or not. Uh, and I know that um, Alicia. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah. before the record, I, I also selected a few um, quotes. I love this one when she said, my greatest crime is to be a free woman in a time when only slaves are tolerated. I was born with a thinking brain at a time when people are trying to kill reason. She said that in her book, Memoir of the Prison for Women, 1983. And she's also said many things uh, in interviews uh, and in outside conference, such as, um, I went to prison because I didn't accept hum humiliation at individual level, family level, country level, global level. Class and patriarchy are linked. We can't separate the political oppression from family and sexual oppression. It is inseparable. This patriarchal system is a slave system that began at the beginning of times. Another one is democracy is not a decision taken in parliament that is decreed on one day. Democracy is an art of living. From childhood, it must be educated to understand and respect equality with my brother, my sister, and the people who work for me. And I love this quote because I think her sociological approach is also an approach that we have and that I have 
is like where where the family is like the nucleus of the society and, and when the family sets uh the example and reflect all the codes and social norms and this is where women are and girls are private property and and where the family is responsible to make sure that these codes are respected and and i think this uh, way to see this sociological way to see help us to understand her global approach and to see violence as a terror uh, as much as it's used in dictatorship and to 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 guarantee um the law of the strongest and 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 the submissions and domination what is the oil of patriarchy and capitalism so um yeah I, um i wanted to bring this to because she's also fighting against all of this form of col uh, colonialism and domination and patriarchy and at the same time she's she's explaining how much home is the most dangerous space for women but how it's the reflect of this systemic violence so uh, this is something very uh, important nowadays uh, to see this has a whole system to change by working on education especially and mentalities and 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 i think feminism is really transversal to all of this and it's uh, it's a lot of challenge with education um yeah, that's why I, I pick up this uh, quote. Thank you. So in this case, if you want, we can proceed with uh, the recording. Uh, if, if you want to say where this recording yeah. come, comes from. And uh, Alicia, when you are starts um, um, playing the, the, uh, the record, uh, I'm going to share the poster of the original, you know, that we had on our Facebook, so that we don't appear there sitting in the screen yes. uh, doing nothing. Yes, but just, um, well, it's a conference we organized in 2011, uh, and we invite her to make um, to make a point on the Egypt uh, revolution and, and all of uh, the current uh uh issues in 2011 so the woman's um uh, implication in the revolutions and she 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 was there in brussels and uh, yes uh she she start answering questions of the public and i choose to uh, let you hear that moment to see how uh frank she was how she didn't she wasn't afraid about polemics and then yeah this is just Personally, I think this is just perfect. Okay, just to let everyone know then, this will be the end of the- of the globally and locally. Because if I have a progressive woman organization and we are united, then when I come to Belgium, then we have, you have a, your organization here. So we coordinate and collaborate together against capitalism and imperialism and patriarchy that's how we work but if we say no we don't need arab organizations or egyptian and we work only globally it is just theory theory no action then um, uh, about racism yes i agree with um, with the uh, our friend who spoke that especially in france there is a lot of racism and now there is islamophobia uh, people are afraid of islam islamophobia it's political and there is a lot of racism against arabs against muslims against the black and against the, mil the immigrants because the right wing groups are gaining power in every country because of the failure of the left because of the failure of the Marxists, the failure of the secularists. My friend, he said he's secular, but he said, why should we force secularism on people, you know? But who said that people are religious? You know, when Nasser came to Egypt, Nasser fought, he, he fought against the Muslim brothers. He fought against the Islamization and he didn't like the Islamic language or Christian language. 
and he united Islam. Nasser united Egypt for economic reasons and social reasons. And we never heard this conflict between Muslims and Christians under Nasser. When Sadat came, Sadat spoke religion. Sadat collaborated with America to open the doors of Egypt for American goods. And Sadat collaborated with the Muslim brothers against socialist groups and secular groups and against feminist groups. And that I, that's why I went to prison under Sadat. Because it was Sadat who brought the Muslim brothers and this Isla Islamic giant to Egypt. And then Mubarak continued. So if we retreat, I am very much against, because many of the Marxists and the left, even here in Belgium, they are retreating and saying that people are religious. So we have to, to adapt to them. No, we have to change. The people, number one, are not religious. The people, they want bread, they want work, they want dignity. The millions who revolted in Egypt revolted for dignity, for justice, social justice, and for freedom. They didn't uh, revolt for Islam or Christianity. They revolted for these three and concrete demands. So we have to be careful because I am noticing the retreat of the left, the retreat of the Marxists. They are retreating and adapting and making, uh, you know, submission to religious groups. And I noticed that here, I, among the Marxists in Belgium, they are retreating in front of Tariq Ramadan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, retreating. And Europe, I, I'll tell you something. Europe, France, uh, Britain, uh, United States, the Iranian revolution started secular. The Iranian revolution started pro Mossadda for economic reason to nationalize the oil of Iran. And it was very powerful and it frightened Britain, France and United States. So they sent Khomeini by plane to abort the secular socialist economic revolution in Iran and to change it to become Islamic revolution. So we have to be careful that the real enemy in front of the American colonialism, French, British, Belgium, and all those governments, the real enemy is an economic, socialist, feminist revolution. <laughs> That's the real enemy. That's the real enemy.